now going to examine the second cranial nerve, or the optic nerve. As you'd expect, the optic nerve is all to do with vision, but it's, in my view, one of the most complicated uh, cranial nerves to examine because there's so many facets to it. What you do in the first instance, however, is examine what you think you're going to examine, that is visual acuity. And you want to see, can someone see in the distance, can someone see up close, and can someone see colour? So far, near, and colour vision are what we start with. Now, the first thing you must ask, a question, uh, the, question, the first question you must ask of a patient is, do they wear glasses and what for? So, uh, do you wear glasses? I do. And what for? I'm short-sighted. Short-sighted, okay. So you use it for, mainly for far vision or for reading? Uh, for far vision. Far vision, okay. So, when testing a um, person's vision, you give them all the chances possible. So if you wouldn't mind putting on your glasses there, Danica, that'd be great. The first thing we're going to do is test far vision with a Schnellen chart. Now, the Schnellen chart is held at six meters away from the patient at the same level as the patient. And you test one eye at a time, and you test corrected vision, i.e. with glasses on, but you can also do it with uncorrected vision, i.e. with glasses off. If someone has contacts, complicates it in the setting of an outpatient, but ultimately leave them on. So I'd ask you if you wouldn't mind covering your right eye first. Thanks, Danica. And you start at the top line and work your way down to the line, the lowest line that you can see, if, if at all possible. So if you could just read some of the letters there. Uh, H, Z, O, R, O, K, D, H, M, Z, O, N, K, C, O, H, S, E, D, D, S, O, O, Z. That's great. So at six meters, Danica can read size six on the Snellen chart, so he's got six, six vision. In other words, that's uh, what used to be called 2020 or perfect vision corrected. If Dunica could not see at six metres any of the lines of the Snellen chart, I move the Snellen chart to three metres, covering one eye again. You then see which line he can read, and at this stage it's no longer six over six, it's now six over three vision, and so on. If then he can't see any of the lines at all, despite how, no matter how close I get to him, then I try and discern whether he can see hand movements in one eye, and if that doesn't work, whether he can see light. So that, as you can see, we're going from normal vision to poor vision to clinical blindness. And you do this for each eye in turn, and you do it for corrected and uncorrected vision. Now, clearly you'll do it much more, more uh, quickly in the examination uh, setting, so just do it with glasses on if possible. Quite frequently, one will find in the outpatient setting that the patient has forgotten their glasses. Um, not a disaster, but uh, you do still need to test visual acuity. In this case, you use a pinhole, and I've mocked one up here, albeit a little crassly, and, and just made a pinhole in a small piece of paper. Now this will try and overcome the refractive error in the uh, affected lens. So in this situation, I ask the patient to cover their left eye and hold the piece of paper if they will. Can you hold that on? And look through the pinhole towards the Snellen chart. Uh, so this is just used in the absence of glasses. Uh, so it's kind of a, a made up glasses, if you like. And hopefully that'll correct the refractive error if there is one and enable us to uh, enable the patient to see better uh, from in far distance. Thank you. The next part of the second nerve is uh, near vision. So in near vision, uh, we're really just testing how someone can read. And again, this is fairly simple. They tend, we tend to use Jaeger plates, J-A-E-G-E-R plates. Um, they're not readily available, it has to be said. So what we tend to do really in, in clinical terms is just get someone to read normal newspaper type print uh, with their glasses on and one eye after another. The next part of the visual acuity uh, aspect of the second cranial nerve examination is colour vision. And it's very important to test this, to test this at, uh, particularly in people who've had previous optic neuritis, because uh, they tend to lose red uh, coloration uh, quite early on. Now, people may report a loss of colour vision to you, uh, and they then might indeed give a family history of this, but you must test it formally with these uh, Isahara plates. Now, they're available um, throughout the world, obviously, and they're very standardised. So as you can see, the plates have a test plate with a number in the middle. So the test plate is usually 12, and you shouldn't, unless one is unable to see at all, you should be able to call this. It doesn't affect colour vision. So I'd give them to Donica, if you don't mind holding those, and I'd ask you to cover one eye. Cover the right eye, we'll always start with. I'll flick through them for you. So as you can see, can you call out the number you see there? And then slowly we'll go. Eight, 29. So that's three out of three. Five, three. Five out of five. Uh, 15 and 74. Seven out of seven. Six, 45. 
9 out of 9. 5, 7. 11 out of 11. Sorry. 16 and 73. 13 out of 13. And then we're back to the test plate, hence the quizzical look on Dunica's face. Uh, so that's the test plate to say the test has ended. So there could be 13 plates in some of the Isahara books or 17 in others. But in essence, you've got perfectly normal color vision in your left eye, and then you repeat the test for the other eye. Uh, and you mark that down then as corrected and uncorrected once more. The next part of the optic nerve examination involves, involves visual fields. And this gives us an overview of uh, what the patient sees, both centrally and peripherally. Now, a gross overview of visual fields when testing is usually quite helpful. Um, so what I tend to do in the clinical situation, to speed things up a little bit, is ask the patient to focus directly on my chin, and I'm going to hold my fingers up here. I'm going to move one finger at a time, or both together indeed, and I want you to only point to the finger I move. So which finger, can you point to the finger I move? Okay, thank you. Okay, perfect. So that, that'll give me a gross idea of what's going on. However, if I suspect that there might be a visual field defect, I need to go into it in a bit more detail. So I'd ask you to gently cover your right eye, focus on the tip of my nose, and I'm covering my left eye, and we're a meter apart. So a meter apart, I will bring my finger in and say, can you tell me the moment you see my finger moving? Now, and from four quadrants, and still with my eye closed, and then up again. Now, can you swap over to the other eye, please? I close my right eye this time. Tell me when you can see it. Keep looking at my nose. Can you see it moving? I can see it. I can see it. I can see it. I can see it. Great. So, thank you very much. So, there's a full range of uh, visual fields on the periphery. Now the next thing you need to do is measure central visual field and often, say for instance in MS, people get optic neuritis and develop a central scotoma. It's not the only reason of course, but it's the most, one of the more common ones in clinical practice. Um, so to examine central vision, uh, you use a red topped hat pin. This is to look at the central visual field. Remember that we all have a blind spot. When you're driving, you know that you have a blind spot and that's where all your optic nerves, where all your nerves are coming into the optic nerve. So as a result, uh, you, if you get any damage to that area there, you lose uh, vision centrally. As a result of that, the first colour to go tends to be red, so hence the red topped hat pin. So you ask the patient to cover their right eye, if they will. This can be quite tricky. I'm not very good at it most of the time, to be honest with you. I'm covering my left eye, and I put the pen up in front of Dunnick, and I say, this is a red topped hat pin. Can you see it? And can you see the colour? Okay. Now... If you keep looking at the tip of my nose, I'm going to bring this in from your left-hand side. And at some point, I will try and identify your blind spot. So what, by which I mean, tell me when the top of the pin disappears. Yeah. Now, okay. So I'm now in, so to speak, his blind spot. And now I need to map it out. So I'm going to move it, and I want you to tell me when the red-topped hat pin reappears. Yeah. Disappears. Reappears. Disappears, reappears, disappears, reappears. Okay, so it's a normal size blind spot, but if I had, if Dunnick had had previous optic neuritis, you'd find that you could get quite a large blind spot there, and it gives us an idea of the underlying pathologies we're heading in towards uh, the optic nerve. The next part of the second cranial nerve examination is examination of the light and accommodation reflex. As you know from childhood, when you're exposed to bright light, your pupils will become smaller. Uh, in the dark, for that reason, uh, you also, when your pupils will become a little bit bigger. So what we do in clinical practice is examine the light reflex with a strong light. Now, we usually dim the lights quite dramatically uh, to allow for this to happen. Now, because the light can transfer from one eye to the other, we often ask the patient to put their hand like that up in between the two eyes. Now, as an overview, what's going to happen here is I'm going to shine a light in Donica's left eye. Now, the mechanism from there is the optic nerve will register this. It will transmit this information back to the pretectal nucleus of the midbrain, which will feed into the, into the Edinger-Westphal nucleus, which will then tell the third nerve to come back to, to bring the parasynthetic supply back to the, uh, to the eye and say, make the pupil smaller. So, 
In simplistic way, it says, there's light on my eye, tell the brain, come back and shut down. Now, what happens is it's a consensual reflex. So as I shine the light in this eye, the other eye will simultaneously constrict. So I shine a light and you shine a very bright light, preferably in the dark, in one eye, it will constrict and you then check and the other one constricts. That's great, thank you. The importance of this is that you also use, when you have the light in your hand and you're doing this, you look for a relative afferent pupillary defect. If someone has had optic neuritis in the past, the insulation, if you like, around that eye, uh, around that optic nerve, has been damaged. So while it'll transmit the signals that are along it, it'll transmit so not as well as it used to. So in other words here, if I've already found a central scotoma, and I, swing, I put a light in, swing the light into this eye, it'll constrict in response to the direct light response, and the other eye will constrict in response to the consensual light reflex. However, to perform the swinging light test, I'll move it, the swing the light from one eye to the other, as one would imagine one would. So just to explain this, I'll have constriction left eye, constriction right eye. Now as I'm swinging the light over, dilation, dilation. Constriction, constriction, dilation, dilation. Constriction, constriction, dilation, dilation. Now at some point in this, the badly affected nerve, the afferent nerve that's been affected will say, almost it'll say, I give up, I can't take all this light. And you'll get a situation where, where you're putting a direct light on that nerve, on that eye, and the eye will be conversely dilating. And that's called relative to the other eye, afferent, the problem's going in, pupillary defect. And it's often seen in someone who's had a previous optic neuritis. The next part of the second cranial nerve examination is accommodation, the other reflex. A little less well understood, but it works through the optic nerve, relaying signals to the visual cortex, and then feeding back to the pretectal nucleus and into the eye via the parasympathetics once more. Again, throughout your examination, I'll repeat myself a lot, unfortunately, but the fact is you must communicate to the patient to make sure that they understand what you're doing. So you must be very clear and say, Donica, I want you to look specifically at the top of that cabinet over there. I'm looking at your far vision now, and then I'm going to ask you to focus on a near object here. And now look away, and now look close. So what happens is one's eyes tend to constrict from looking from far to near. An easier way of doing the accommodation reflex is doing them all together, as if people don't mind. I'm going to make, ask you to make you go almost cross-eyed, if you like. So as I, as I move my finger in from afar, his eyes will converge, and his pupils will get smaller. So follow right in, go cross-eyed. That's perfect. Well done. Not easy, I accept that, but uh, you did very well. So there are the accommodation reflexes and the light reflexes. And disturbances of these um, are really good uh, red flags, if you like, of eye disease. The clinical pointers here uh, are crucial. Oftentimes, we will be presented with someone who has just developed a large pupil or indeed a small pupil. So you say, well, for example, if Danica has a single large pupil and he comes to a neurologist and says, oh, my pupil is, I woke up this morning, my pupil is large. You have to look at, well, is it just in isolation or is it due to other causes? The first thing you always think of are drugs. So a large pupil is illicit drugs such as cocaine, uh, or eye drops that used for dilating the eye can cause it. The other thing you think of is a third nerve palsy, but in which case you'll have other features as we'll see on the uh, rest of this video. But there's no evidence of ptosis and the, pupil, the, the eye is in the normal position. And then the third cause, the fourth cause is uh, uh, Holmes 80 pupil, in which case it's a pupil that reacts very sluggishly to light and it might be a Holmes 80 syndrome in which the reflexes are reduced. So drugs, third nerve and causes thereof, and a Holmes 80 pupil will be the common causes of a dilated pupil. If, on the other hand, a small pupil is seen, then you say, again, it's drugs. Is it opiates? Is the person taking opiates for some reason? And if it's not that, you think of a Horner syndrome, in which you have ptosis, meiosis, or small pupil, anhydrosis, and enophthalmus, and then you know the causes of Horner syndrome, or is it due to syphilis, argyle robertson pupil in particular? So therefore, you see the importance of this and the reactions of accommodation and light to the clinical setting. Um, I think a lot of students find uh, the ophthalmoscope particularly daunting. Uh, I certainly know I did for many years. But if you keep it nice and simple and try and understand it in the very basics, uh, basic terms, I think you'll be able to get a handle on it earlier than uh, I did. The first thing you have to do is learn how to turn it on. 
So they vary, and they'll vary from hospital to hospital, but at least acquaint yourself with the ophthalmoscope. The second thing is, once you've learned how to turn it on, which isn't rocket science, you then set the diopters to zero. You put your index finger on the dial, and you hold it up, and first check that you know what you're doing by looking at your own hand. And once you can see your own hand, at least you know where you are in space, if you like. Now, then you bring the patient and say, I want you to darken the room, and you ask the patient to focus on a specific point in the distance, if they don't mind. Now, if you know the pupils are very small, you may have to dilate them, but that's not usually practicable in the clinic. So what I do is I put my hand on the patient's shoulder, if they don't mind, ask them to focus in the distance, and from a distance here, I start to focus and look for the red reflex. Then I come in gently, and gradually, with my index finger, I'll adjust, particularly if I know, as Donica does, wear glasses. So as I adjust, I'm trying to look at the back of his eye. Now, it's very difficult. People, for many years, will say, I can't see anything. But what you're looking for, in essence, are blood vessels in the first instance. So you're looking for blood vessels. And I always describe it like spaghetti going down the sink. And so the blood vessels heading towards the optic nerve. And once you pick on one blood vessel, you follow it along. Don't be distracted. Follow it along towards the optic disc. And that's, your, uh, that's, that's really what you're looking to see. So you're looking to see the whole uh, disc, of course, but you're heading towards the optic disc itself and the optic nerve head. And you're looking to see, is it like the plug hole of the sink? Is it well demarcated or is it blurry? And you should know quite a number of things about uh, ophthalmoscopy and fundoscopy indeed. So the things you should particularly know about are changes that you see on the fundus of hypertension and the four uh, different stages of it, the changes of diabetes, the changes of papilledema and the causes thereof, and the changes of optic atrophy and the causes thereof. Finally, you should know what causes pigmentation on the retina. For example, Refson's disease is a rare disease, but also mitochondrial disorders or indeed retinitis pigmentosa. When you're going from the right eye, as I just did, to the left eye, same overall setup, but this time you must move to your left, to put the ophthalmoscope in your left hand. So your left index finger is on the dial, and you come to the left side of the patient. So you come around to this side, same setup, look into the distance, and you must come in from the left, like this. And I would really urge you not to give up. You need to keep on going, because it's quite hard, and everyone appreciates that. But, and, and don't lie. I mean, I always pretended that I could see things I couldn't see initially because to try and please my professors and things. But to be honest, that's, as I found out in due course, you will get found out it's a little pointless.